Hello, I'm Jo Fay, and this is a Swiss Info podcast. Swiss Info is the multilingual and international public media company of Switzerland. Welcome back to part four of six in our Davos journey. Today, our science journalists, Sara Ibrahim and Michele Andina, are visiting the Physical Meteorological Observatory. It was founded by a Prussian businessman and amateur meteorologist in the early 20th century. Today, researchers here are developing radiometers used by weather stations all over the world, and they're collaborating on several space experiments to find out more about solar physics. To make more accurate predictions about climate change, researchers need to better understand solar cycles. We know that they last about 11 years. But why is there a lot of activity in some cycles and very little in others? Understanding this also helps predict solar flares, which can interfere with technology on Earth such as electricity grids, navigation and communications. Let's join Sara and Michele. Getting to the Meteorological Observatory is a bit of a walk up the hill. It's one of the oldest institutes in Davos. In this observatory, scientists measure solar radiation. This is crucial for detecting and modeling climate change. We are welcomed by the director, Louise Hara. So we have a climate modeling group um, here and they have built and developed uh, models of the atmosphere, which is very complex. We're, mm -hmm. we're sitting in the lowest part of the atmosphere that we're, we're breathing in. But as you go further away from the atmosphere, um, towards the edge of space, you know, like towards the edge, um, the physics and the chemistry changes throughout. Those models can then be used to estimating and predicting what will happen in the future, depending on different scenarios. So if we stay on track with reducing the the Earth's temperature, what will happen if we, we don't, and countries don't work together, what will happen? The observatory was founded in 1907 by the chemist Carl Dorno, who came to Davos to find relief for his daughter suffering from tuberculosis. So he wanted to understand why the atmosphere here was so good for patients with lung conditions. So he developed instruments to understand the atmosphere. Over the years, it's become bigger and bigger, and in the 1970s, it became the World Radiation Center, where we're hosting the world standard for radiation measurements from the sun. Mm -hmm. So actually, all the measurements, uh, instruments for the sun are coming here to be tested, right? That's right. So uh, countries around the world, governments, med offices, want to have the most accurate measurements around the world, and this is really key measurements for climate models, for solar energy companies, and they come here to have their instruments um, calibrated. We do a big calibration campaign every five years where everybody comes here. Instruments are everywhere, inside the building, on the roof and in the garden. Scientist Natalia Curemeti shows us around. I like a lot the institute and the job. And all the instruments that we have here, also producing instruments, mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. really... So it's exciting. It's very exciting. The snow, though, not that much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, careful. We are now stepping outside of the building, onto a terrace and make our way up to the roof via a metal stair. Wow. So this is our roof. No sun, huh? No sun, but nice view. Yeah. What do you do he up here? So up here we measure the solar irradiance in different spectral regions and for different conclusions. Mm -hmm. And apart from the research, we also are a calibration center. So we have a lot of reference instruments here that people send their own instruments and then they get a calibration. So for example, this is our reference instrument uh, for uh, the infrared. It's 
so they are calibrated and um, a group of instruments uh, has the true value, let's say. Okay. And then the other instrument comes here, they measure simultaneously, and then you compare, compare. and then you give a calibration okay. value. Every instrument is protected with a white dome-shaped cover the size of a plate. These domes are because the, all the instruments are uh, heated and you see there is some air mm -hmm. blowing. Ah, oh, yeah. Yes, so to keep them in a rather protected environment from the snow. We are glad to get back inside the warm building and are now going down to the basement. Do you know how many researchers are working here? I think we are about um, 35. 35? Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, going to show you quickly the dark side of the measurements. Yes. Dark side, mm -hmm. I like yes. it. This room so, is used for calibrations. Uh, it's black to avoid any light disturbance. This is a laser that uh, you can uh, select whatever wavelength you like. So if you like to have green, then you have green. Here you send one wavelength, and then you measure here the response uh, of uh, the instrument. There are many more instruments in the garden. There's one for measuring dust particles in the atmosphere, and one that takes infrared pictures of the sky, and many more. Each provides its own piece of data for the scientists to work with but there's much more information that comes out of space. The Davos Observatory was involved in building two instruments on board the ESA Solar Orbiter, launched in 2020. Luis Hara shows us some video footage shot by the spacecraft. So this spacecraft um, gets all the way as close as Mercury mm -hmm. to the Sun. So we're getting in close to the Sun to try and understand that activity. And this movie is showing us um, data from January to March, and that was when we were getting to our closest point to do the very first proper science close point per helion. Um, so during this time, um, we can see a lot of activity. So the data you're seeing is measuring high energies on the sun. So it's about a million degrees. So it's so really quite hot, quite different to what you see day to day. And a curiosity, because I see here in this image the sun is yellow, but in the other one is, is red. Why yeah, that? It's that, a temperature those are, question. Those, those are false colors, actually, because it, this is what the wavelength you're looking at here is extreme ultraviolet. So it's a, a wave band that we can't see by the human eye. So mm -hmm. some, some animals can see this wavelength, but, but we simply can't. We are only in this very narrow visible range. So um, these images allow us to see something we cannot see by eye. And we, <laughs> we choose the colors because for us, we know, I know to look at that, that's the filter, that's one million okay. degrees. Um, <laughs> but it's not, it's not a real color at all. What's the real color of the sun then? So for us, when we're looking at it, I mean, we look in visible light, so it is sort of yellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The sun, we look in the sky and it looks like a white ball or a yellow mm -hmm. ball. But it is actually a star that changes. It's a middle-aged star. But it varies on timescales from minutes to days to weeks to months to years. We need to understand that variability because that's a basic input to climate models. We also need to understand that variability because it creates um, activity that affects us here on Earth through the impact on technology. The most recent example was with Elon Musk's company launching uh, more of his spacecraft and he lost about 40 of those due to mm -hmm. solar storms. Mm -hmm. So the sun's currently in a higher activity phase. Those time scales that it changes on are, we understand to some extent, but we, we don't understand enough. We don't understand the trigger of um, a big explosion in the sun. We don't understand the cycles enough. You know, will the next cycle be much larger than this one? We, we still have a lot to learn. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you can have your cold coffee now. <laughs> if you want to see what these instruments look like, this series is also available as short videos. Go to swissinfo.ch and search for Science Davos.
Next time we'll talk about avalanches and take you inside the cold chambers of the WSL Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research. Today's episode was recorded and edited by our science and video journalist, Michaeli Andina. For more content, visit our website, swissinfo.ch. I'm Joe Fay. Thanks for listening. Do you want to polish your knowledge about Swiss elections, referendums and political parties, while at the same time learning more about the quirks of the political system in Switzerland? If that's the case, our newsletter course is just what you need. Each week for a month, we'll send you a free instalment explaining the most important details of how Swiss democracy works. Our course teaches you who's eligible to vote in Switzerland, what the different parties stand for, how election and popular vote results are implemented, and what distinguishes Swiss democracy from other political systems. Our crash course is interactive, like democracy itself. Your questions will be answered on an FAQ page, and you can debate with other users and share your inputs and opinions. We will also provide links to multimedia articles and videos to help you better understand the Swiss democratic system. Please join us and sign up for the free Democracy Crash Course newsletter at www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. That's www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. 